Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on uh, from where you're joining us today. My name is Abel Ndasho, and I'm the program coordinator for the ANH Academy and Imana program based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you very much for joining us on this webinar today on social and behavior change essentials co-hosted in collaboration with um, GIZ. I hope most of you know about the NH Academy and our Academy members, but in case if you're not, um, the Agriculture, Nutrition and Health Academy is a global network of researchers, practitioners and policymakers from over 100 countries working at the intersection of agriculture, food systems, nutrition and health. It serves as a platform for learning and sharing. Um, if you're not a member yet, we encourage you to join us and to, to sign up. You can go to our website and, and join for free. As well as convening the technical working groups, hosting webinars like this one and curating a blog, we also have an annual meeting of the Agriculture, Nutrition and Health community called the ANH Academy Week. Uh, two weeks ago, we held our first virtual ANH Academy, that's ANH 2020 where we had nine interactive learning sessions, learning lab sessions uh, delivered by experts from around the world in the first week, followed by a research conference where we had more than 50 abstract driven presentations, including a keynote speech by a Nobel laureate, Agnes Deaton and plenary session um, touching on the impact of COVID-19 on our shared work. Resources from the virtual ANH Academy week, um, including videos from all of our oral and poster presentation, learning lab materials, and recordings of all sessions during the conference are now um, available on our website, and you can find it there. That's anh-academy.org slash anh2020. Um, I think that's it for me for now. Um, over to you, Annette. Thank you very much, Abel. Uh, also from my side, I would like to give a, you a warm welcome to the today's webinar social and behavior essentials. I'm very pleased that we are holding this webinar together with the ANH Academy. My name is Annette Roth. I'm working for GIZ's project, Agricultural Policy and Food and Nutrition Security. GIZ works on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. And together with our partners, we are implementing agricultural and food and nutrition security projects in many countries. In order to reach our project goals, in many projects, one of the most important conditions is that people start to behave differently, start to adopt and sustain new behaviors. Telling or teaching people what to do often is not that effective. But how can we support behavior change processes effectively? Which are the right approaches? Against the background of these questions, we have started a learning process. And what I have learned so far is that focusing on people, focusing on their perspective, that is a first important step. Uh, the today's webinar is the first of a series of webinars on SPC, which will be running through the next month. And it aims to facilitate and integrate um, SPC effectively into each stage of our intervention. We have been able to engage experienced SPC practitioners and researchers who will share useful guidance and inspiration. The topics of the next webinars include identification of the key barriers and motivators to change, design of SPC strategies, development of effective SPC messages and materials, and monitoring and evaluation of SPC interventions. Today, I'm very much looking forward to Danielle's presentation on SPC Essentials. I now wish us all an interesting and fruitful webinar. And I'm also looking forward to your contributions and to learning from your experience. Um, and now I hand over to Cecilia. 
thank you, Annabelle. Greetings, everyone. My name is Cecilia Gonzalez, and I am a co-leader of the Act to Mood community, and I will be your moderator for this webinar series. Um, I'm going to introduce our presenter today is Danielle Chekaru. Um, Danielle has 24 years of experience working in public health in developing countries. 13 of those years, she has specialized in social and behavior change communication. Danielle has worked for ministries of health, UN agencies, Save the Children, Oxfam, Action Against Hunger, and many other nonprofit organizations. Uh, for these organizations and these different work she has done, she has developed high level SBC strategies and supported their implementation. Welcome, Danielle. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, uh, depending on where you are in the world. And thanks for taking time out to be with us on the call today. So um, I hope that you find it valuable professionally and personally. I understand that we are going to have a lot of participants who are well seasoned in the social behavior change field. So much of this is going to be rudimentary for you. But we also have some who are fairly new and just trying to get an introduction to the field. But I think that regardless of where you are, most of us understand that social behavior change is important if we want to impact in our programs. So I wanted to start by saying that there are really hundreds of SBC theories out there and a plethora of studies around each of them. But for the purpose of this introductory session, I've been asked to cover a few theories and their practical implementation in the field. And over the course of the webinar series, you're going to examine many of these principles more thoroughly. So my goal really is to give you an introduction to SBC and some practical examples of why it's a necessary element and uh, how you can actually implement things in the field. So I'll try to do most of my sharing through examples, which will helpfully help you remember not only the content, but also illustrate how the principles can be used practically in your work. All right, so why SBC? Um, when I onboarded with World Vision International as a regional advisor in 2007, I was really shocked to learn that community health workers, program staff were trying to teach the same things to women in their intervention areas that I had taught them more than a decade before. And what was even more shocking was that Peace Corps had been on the ground in Niger for already about 30 years by the time I came on board. And so certainly what I understood is that we were all missing something when it came to educating our beneficiaries around behaviors and outcomes. This is, uh, um, I shall want to share a story with you. I was doing a field visit in 2009 as a supervisor for World Vision and I was in a local health clinic that we supported and I met this woman and her name is Fatu. And um, I remember wanting to listen to what the nurse had was giving her advice because clearly this child was severely malnourished. And so I listened to what the nurse had to say and then I began to ask her myself and I asked her what she was feeding her child and she said she was feeding her child porridge every day. And so then I asked her, you know, what are you putting in the porridge? Can you put, uh, you know, she said, well, I'm just making it with millet and water. So I said to her, can you put some oil in your porridge? And she said, no, she said, I don't have any oil. And so I said to her, what about milk? Because she's a Fulani woman and generally Fulani people in Niger sell milk and they usually have access to it. And she said, no, I don't have any milk. And then I said to her, what about a little bit of sugar? And she actually burst out laughing and she looked me in the face and she said, where do you think I am going to get sugar? And she said, let me explain something to you. She said, my husband takes the millet harvest and he locks it in a shed in our yard. And at the beginning of the week, he gives me a measure or a bowl of millet and tells me that this is what I have to feed my children and myself for the week. And I don't get any more than that. And I was just, when I got over being a little bit stunned, I said, well, where does your husband eat? Does he eat with the family? And she said, no, he eats out in the village with his friends. And uh, 
so I, um, I was clearly understanding that there was more to social and behavior change and there was more that had to be done to be able to get our objectives met than what we were doing. So clearly this woman knew uh, some things about child health and nutrition. She knew her child was sick because she was at the clinic seeking help and yet she didn't have what she needed. There was no supportive system in place for her. So I knew that at that time I needed to do something differently. I didn't understand SBC. I didn't know it as a science. I didn't understand the terminology, but I became determined to help my staff understand how programming should be done so that we can invoke change. So today we're going to talk about what SBC is and what it's not. We're going to discuss where knowledge fits into the overall picture of SBC. And we're going to talk about several theories and we're going to listen to examples of their practical application in the field. And then at the end, we're going to wrap up by discussing some small doable actions that each of us can do to integrate SBC into our work. So the first thing I want to ask you, let's look at this statement. It says behavior change is about increasing knowledge about a particular problem, teaching a new skill or educating people about the benefits of a behavior. And I think we have a really quick poll that we're going to launch right now. And I want to ask each of you, Abel gave you instructions. I think that the poll will pop up and you can just vote. What do you think? Is this fact or myth? So let's look at that. So we've got about 73% of people who voted, I think, and we've got about half and half there. Half of us think that that is a myth and half of us think that that is fact. All right, so actually that is a myth, okay? So um, behavior change uh, is not just about telling people about a problem or teaching a new skill or educating people. And I think that that's one of the biggest mistakes that we've actually made in our programs across all sectors, actually. So we're going to talk about this principle. So if you voted that this was fact, I hope that at the end you can see why we have debunked this myth. But if you think about it in your own life, think about all of the things in your own personal life that you actually know about that you believe you have a high level of knowledge about, that you probably understand or you have skills to do, that you know are good for you, but you don't actually do it. And just reflect upon that when you think about this statement. So I wanna talk about a little bit about principles of change. Now, if you Google principles of change, you're gonna find a whole lot of different information, lots of different theories, lots of different sources, but this one comes from a professor. Uh, I took a class in grad school which was focused on, it was actually a systems management and systems thinking class, or the idea that distinctive parts formulate a complex whole. So when I thought of the situation with Fatu that I just shared, I realized how important a systems approach would be in social behavior change. And I've never forgotten that. And so when I began to specialize in SBC, I found these upcoming principles really helpful to maintain a holistic approach to program planning for behavior change. So in a minute, we're going to look at a commonly used SBC theory that emphasizes a systems approach. Of course, it uses different terminologies. But at the time, I had no idea about SBC. I didn't understand any theories associated with that science, but this made a huge impact on me. And so when I started to try to implement SBC, this is where I started. And this is adapted from a, um, a man called Howard Hendricks, who did a lot of work in personal and systems and management behavior change. And the first one is that sometimes people must have a reason to change. So my family's from Texas and we have a saying there and we say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so oftentimes we approach things and uh, we begin to do some introduction into behaviors by telling people that what they're doing is wrong or is incorrect. I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, there's a, a story that's told and it's called Grandmother's Boiled Potatoes. And it's a story about a young couple who were newly married. And as young couples tend to do, they were in the kitchen together trying to make a meal. 
And so the young bride peeled her potatoes and she cut the ends of the potato off and threw them into the trash bin and then put the center part of the potato into a pot. And so her new husband watched her do this with two or three potatoes and finally looked at her and very, uh, you know, curiously said, why are you throwing away the ends of the potatoes? And she stopped and she thought about it and she said, you know, I really don't know. It's just that's the way that my mother did it. And so they sat down, had their meal, and sometime later she was talking to her mother and she brought up the story and she asked her mother, why, when you cook your potatoes, do you cut the ends of the potato off and throw them in the trash? And the mother stopped and thought about it and said, you know, I really don't know. My mother always did it that way. And so now we have two generations of doing something a certain way. So come a holiday time, the whole family's sitting around and they're around the table and the story comes up again. And so the young granddaughter asks her grandmother, tells the story about how she was making potatoes and she threw the ends of the potatoes in the trash and her new husband found that very bizarre. So she asked the grandmother why she cut the ends of the potato off and threw them away instead of putting them in the pot. And the grandmother just kept on eating and chewing and just as normal as could be said, well, my pot was too small. So you see the story illustrates that many times people do something because it's what they're taught by seeing other people do it or because it's their tradition or because it's their habit. And there may or may not be passionately linked to that particular behavior, but oftentimes we go in to try and change people's behavior by telling them that what they're doing is wrong or incorrect. Think about how you feel when somebody watches you do something and just initially tells you that you're wrong. And we'll look at some more examples of that later on in the process. But you can see if you're told right from the beginning that you're not going to be open to a change if a change is presented in a way that doesn't align with your values. The next one is that people must be ready for a change. So unexpected change causes all types of reactions that hinder our change process. Think about a situation where you've been in an unexpected change that was just dropped on you. How did you react and what was the fallout? Most of us have been through mandated changes in our workplace, at home or in communities. We don't have to look very far in this time of coronavirus pandemic to see how change has affected large groups of people and the different reactions that have surfaced. So um, we now know that we should wear masks, we have to use hand sanitizer, we have to wash our hands, we can't enjoy public places like we did in the past, we're supposed to avoid large gatherings. Uh, somebody shared a video with me this morning, actually I looked at it, about people just trying to hand out face masks in a public place and how some people reacted, they were very thankful, other people were violent, other people were uh, offended, other people were angry. And so mismanaged change can cause all sorts of unintended fallout. So that's the point of the next, uh, of that point. The third one is that people have to be involved in the change. So if we don't involve people and we sit in our offices and we write programs for change, we'll surely miss the mark. We're gonna miss out on important values, principles, cultural aspects and beliefs which will stop progress and we'll waste a lot of time and energy. So oftentimes people we work and we work with um, know what they need in order to adopt behaviors. They just need support in implementing it. So this is a couple that I knew. Um, I had tried to do an agriculture nutrition project in a community and my goal was to get the women to collectively to plant fruit trees in their yards, in their concessions. And when I first began the project, so men in the village came and told me that it wouldn't work. And I was a young Westerner trying to save the world overseas. And uh, I thought, you know, oh, the men are just being terrible to the women. Of course, the women can do this. Of course, there's not going to be a problem. And so I plowed through really without listening very well to what these men in the, in the community were trying to tell me. And I came to find out it was very difficult to get women to sign up and pay their small portion for the fruit trees. And uh, some women paid and then they came back and asked for their money back. And what I came to find out at the end of the project was in this culture, the idea of having co-wives was very common. So a man would have two, three or four wives in his home 
And what would happen is that women didn't feel a sense of true ownership in that home. So there was always the possibility in their mind that they could split up with their husband. And if they did that, the tree would stay in the yard and then their co-wives and their co-wives' children would benefit from the tree. And I was completely shocked by this understanding uh, because in my Western mind, you know, I was focused on the child and, and what benefit the child would get from that and even other children in the area. But the dynamic in the value system was such that women were just not willing to put something forth in a sense of permanence in that environment when really that land was owned by a man and all of the co-wives and co-wives children could have access to the land. So if I had been more astute about SBC and involved people in change, I would have had a more successful project. And here's the fourth principle. People have to be surrounded by models of change. So others who are enthusiastic about the change are often the best source that we have to invoke change among other people. People around the world share a common characteristic. We all want what others have. If one farmer has a good harvest and has had success with a method, other houses want that as well. So we want to have what our neighbors have. And this is how we use social norms to influence change. So we can use this effect to uh, someone who's already implemented a change and show the benefit of that behavior to others. And that helps us to invoke change. We have to create these supportive environments. So what do you think about this statement? Here's another poll for you. Please go ahead and launch that poll. Uh, social and behavior change is a one-off activity that must be in the budget and incorporated into programming. So what do we think about this? What do we think about social behavior change as a one-off activity? It has to be in the budget. It has to be in programming. Let's just give that poll a couple of seconds to run. Okay, so we've got about 40%, uh, 38% who say that that's true, and we've got about 62% that say that that's false. So this one is kind of a trick question, but I'm glad you're participating. <laughs> okay, so this is a false statement. Um, it is true that behavior change has to be planned for, and it must be included in your budget, but it's not true that it's a one-off. The fact is that SBC is an ongoing process, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, in just a few more slides. So if you answered that that was true, take a look at that statement and think about what we talk about as we proceed to understand why that that's false. So the first thing we need to understand is what is a behavior, right? Um, I'm amazed how many times I go into a country office to do a training and I say, well, what behaviors are you promoting? And people say things like this to me. So let's look at these. Are these behaviors? You can go to your participant tab and click a yes or no. Cecilia, can you we see We have that? about, yeah, we have about uh, maybe 13 and 14 people are answering now. So it's about half and half people say yes and no. And uh, same thing in the chat box. Okay, we have... so we've got about a 50-50 yes or no. So now look at these statements again, exclusive breastfeeding, row planting, proper storage. Now look at these statements. What do you think about these? Mothers of children, zero to six months, give them only breast milk. Farmers with less than one hectare of land plant their corn crops in rows. Targeted farmers store their grain in improved silos immediately upon harvest. Can you see a difference between these types of statements? Can you see how these statements are very clear? It tells us who is supposed to do the behavior. It tells us what they're supposed to do. And then it often gives us some parameters or some important details like this one immediately upon harvest. So you can see the difference between the first statements and these statements. So these are what we call behavior statements and behavior statement is really our compass. So when we're trying to invoke change, the first thing we need to understand is how to correctly define behaviors because this is also what helps us with our monitoring and evaluation. And you're going to have a session, a webinar on monitoring and evaluation. So I hope you come back for that. It will be very, very interesting and useful. So there are hundreds of behavior change theories out there. And social scientists continue to research and try to understand human behavior. 
But from my experience and tools I use, I've penned this definition to guide my work. So let's just look at this very quickly. Social and behavior change communication is the process of dialoguing with a priority group member in a timed and targeted manner to help reveal barriers and enablers using critical thinking skills to set in place a supportive environment where a new behavior can be adopted and sustained such that continued practice of the behavior leads to the desired positive outcome. So that's packed with a lot of stuff. It's very wordy, but let's just focus really quickly on the red highlights. Process, that goes back to what we just told you was a myth. SBC is not a one-off activity. And often when I look at program plans under SBC, what I see in program plans and budgets are things like celebrate wash day, print t-shirts, print and distribute hats, and those sorts of things. So we have to understand that those are social marketing tools to raise awareness, but that is not the process of behavior change. The next one is dialoguing. Think back to that story I just told you about the tree planting with Washaba and her husband. If I had dialogued better, I would have understood their underlying values and priorities and a little bit more about the culture, and I could have helped make that, process, that uh, project more successful. A priority group member is the person who's mentioned in the behavior statement. That's the person who does the behavior. So when we had exclusive breastfeeding, we had mothers of children zero to six months. When we had farmers, we had farmers with less than a hectare of land. That's a priority group member. Timed and targeted manner means that we need to give people information at the right time for them to practice it and stuff that is relevant to them. Remember the first principle of behavior change. People have to have a reason to change. If it's not a relevant behavior to them, then it's going to be difficult for us to invoke change. To help them reveal barriers and enablers. These are things that hinder a behavior and things that help people practice a behavior. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Using critical thinking skills. Now, critical thinking skills is something I focus on a lot during my training. I give program implementers a lot of practice in using critical thinking skills. And the reason I do that is because what I've seen traditionally in the past is what we tend to do is we tend to train our program implementers, our community health workers, our extension agents, whomever we have in the field. We train them very, very well technically but we don't even train them on critical thinking skills or problem solving. We don't train them how to talk to people and have that dialogue. We don't train them how to identify barriers or to solve problems. And so what happens is when people have a problem, they come back to them and they repeat the technical knowledge. So people have a very high level of knowledge, but other barriers that prevent practice. We have to set in place a supportive environment. Think about the story of Fatu. I could have given her all the knowledge in the universe, but she did not have a supportive environment where she could practice that behavior. So if I'm going to teach something to someone, I have the responsibility to ensure that they are surrounded in an environment that supports that change. And that we have to remember that we want new behaviors adopted, but they also need to be sustained. You'll probably talk in the next seminar about a social behavior change theory called stages of change. And so we know that once people practice something, they don't always continue. Think of yourself. How many times have you tried an exercise regimen and then stopped? How many times have you tried a style of eating or a diet and stopped? How many times have you started writing a book and stopped or doing prayer and meditation and then stopped? So we all have behaviors in our lives that we start and stop. And so the important thing is to realize that behaviors must be sustained because we want that desired positive outcome. The next thing we're going to talk about is tenets of change. So these are sort of laws, principles. These come from the practical guide to conducting a barrier analysis. Your next webinar is going to discuss this in detail, but it's important to keep these things in mind. And the first one is that just because a person knows about a behavior or its benefits doesn't mean he'll do it. That story you can think about Fatu, you can think about Washaba, the two stories I've already shared, you can think about yourself and all of the things you know you should do that have a benefit that you don't take time or energy to do. The next one is just because a person wants to do behavior doesn't mean they'll do it. 
We all have things in our lives that we genuinely want to do, but we have barriers. Most often we call those excuses, but there are often very real barriers that keep us from doing things that we actually really want to do. And we need to understand that when we're looking at implementing a behavior change program. The next one is sometimes people do things that are good for their health or good for them, not necessarily just in the health field, but even agriculture, resource management, whatever it is you're implementing, but not for the reason that we promote. Um, I can think of my children like to play sports. They don't do that because they understand the health benefit. They do it because they like the competition. They like the teamwork. They like the social aspect. They like getting out of the house. There's a story about a woman named Susan Powder who became a billionaire in the late 80s, early 90s. She was grossly obese. She was very overweight. The doctors told her she was severely diabetic and she was having heart problems. She was going to die. She was the mother of children who were about eight and nine years old. She ended up turning her life around, losing, I don't know, 200 pounds, uh, becoming a fitness guru, making billions of dollars. And I saw her on an interview and the interviewer asked her, what was your motivation? And she said, you know, it wasn't the doctor. It wasn't the fact that she was a mother. It wasn't her children. It was the fact that she discovered that her husband was having an extramarital affair. And she said simply, I wanted to look better than my husband's girlfriend. And so she changed her life and hundreds of thousands of other lives and her motivation was not health. The next one is that just because a person fears a given outcome doesn't mean they'll take action to prevent it. We saw this a lot in the early days of HIV and AIDS. In the beginning, testing was a diagnosis for death and we didn't have good tools, resources, medicines to help people who were HIV positive. But many people were adverse to getting tested because they didn't want, they saw what happened with their friends and neighbors and loved ones who became stigmatized, who became outcast, who lost their property, whose children were orphaned. They saw that all around them and they thought, it's better that I not get tested than to lose all my hope. And if I just die, but people don't know it's AIDS, then I won't be cast out from my people and my society. So oftentimes we try to invoke change by telling people to fear an outcome and actually that can paralyze them. That's not that that fear is not useful and we'll talk about that when we get to determinants of behavior. And the last one is if you choose the wrong behavior to promote, you will have little or no impact on the problem you're trying to address. I had a professor in grad school who said the most important question of epidemiology is the question, so what? So if I do something, if I choose the wrong behavior, I'm not gonna have the desired impact or outcome. I worked in a malaria program in Sierra Leone. And uh, when I first began working there, I looked at data from years before, knowledge that mosquito bites cause malaria was very, very high up like 98%, okay? Utilization of insecticide treated bed nuts was very low and that's what we were trying to increase. What happened in that time was a lot of wash programming, but got implemented into everything. And people started using wash, wash messages in malaria. And so when the next time they did the survey, what they found was that women thought that malaria was caused by dirty water. They thought it was caused by dirty fruit. They thought it was caused by leaving things around your house. So they actually backtracked on what people actually knew because they got their messages mixed. So you need to be careful when you plan your programs, what is it you're trying to get across and what information do people need to know and understand so as not to confuse them. This is an activity I call the barrier road and I do this activity when I'm doing an introduction to SBC because I think it's a good analogy for what SBC is, okay? So let's just pretend that you are my travel agent and you are going to try to get me to take a trip. I'm at a starting point over here. I, you can see my pointer and this is my destination, this little Google flag over here up in the far right hand top corner. You wanna get me to that destination. So you need to tell me where I'm going. The first thing you have to do is tell me what the behavior is. That's my destination. It's like saying, Danielle, you're going on a trip from Phoenix, Arizona, and you're going to London, England, okay? So when we talk about the journey, people who don't do a behavior are called non-doers. That's where we start. And so what we're trying to do is get non-doers up to our 
destination, okay? So we're walking, we take the destination, you show me the road, and all of a sudden I come to a place where the road is inundated with water. So now this is a barrier. This is something that is gonna make me turn around and go home unless I have some support or help or intervention. So let's just say, you say, okay, Danielle, I want you to continue this journey. So I'm gonna give you this bathing suit for you to swim across the water. And I tell you, no, 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 I'm afraid of that water. I don't know how to swim. That is not an acceptable solution for me. Let's talk about something else. This is dialoguing, okay? And so I say, no, I don't want that. You say, how about a canoe? And I say, okay, yes, a canoe is acceptable to me. I can take the canoe and I can get through that barrier. Then I continue my journey and I come to a place where a huge tree has fallen in the road, okay? Again, I'm gonna turn around and abandon that journey unless I get help, support, or an intervention. This is another barrier. It's a different barrier than the water. So my canoe is not an acceptable solution to this barrier. And this is a problem we often make in behavior change is when people encounter any barrier, we go back to giving them technical information, telling them why it's important. This goes to the very first myth we discussed in the first poll. Just because we tell somebody something is important doesn't mean we've helped them to practice the behavior. So let's say you tell me, you decide I'm gonna give you a chainsaw. And you assume that with the chainsaw, I'm gonna continue my journey. But I say, no, no, I don't know how to use that. It scares me. I'm afraid I'm gonna cut my finger off. It's noisy, I don't know that. That's not an acceptable solution for me. This is something we only find out if we dialogue. If we sit in our offices and we distribute chainsaws in a metaphorical sense, then we're gonna have a lot of people who are not gonna continue past that barrier. So I say, no, I'm familiar with an ax. I'll use an ax. So you give me an ax, I can chop through that and I can continue my journey. That becomes the enabler that helps me to overcome that barrier. So now I continue my journey and now there's boulders blocking my road. My canoe is not gonna be helpful to me, is it? It's a different barrier. My ax is not gonna be helpful to me because this is a different and unique barrier. But now you say, I'll give you a bulldozer and I say, that's great, you bulldoze that out of my way and I can continue my journey and I can become a doer. Okay, so that's kind of the process and a good analogy for social behavior change. It is a journey, it's continuous, and it requires that we continue to dialogue with people to find acceptable solutions. In doing that, this is something that's called the social ecological model, and this is what goes back to those first principles of change that I shared with you. This is a, a widely uh, utilized theory that's been adapted many times by various organizations. It's been used as the basis for health programming since the 1970s. The model was designed to provide a framework for designing behavior change interventions, and it takes into account social and physical settings and external factors that influences a person's ability to act. So they were developed to further understand the dynamic interrelationships among various personal and environmental factors. Now, this is a very simplified version that I use when working with uh, program offices to help implementers and designers understand the programming, that we have to do programming at all levels for behavior change. And we can't just focus on convincing an individual. Again, going back to that first myth, okay? Um, so, if we look at this here, if we want to impact the health of this little child here in this pregnant woman, we can't focus on that child as a priority group or even the mother who's going to do most of those behaviors. Why? Because she lives in a household. She has a spouse. There may be siblings in her household. She has parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, in-laws. All of those people can have an impact on whether or not she does or doesn't do this behavior. And whatever behavior it is, whether it's a health behavior, a farming behavior, a natural resource management behavior, a wash behavior. And beyond her own household level, there's a community level here surrounded and filled with influencers like religious leaders, traditional leaders, school teachers, healthcare providers, extension agents, local businessmen, friends, neighbors. Remember, we talked about that fourth principle of change. People want to do what other people do. This is how we impact a social norm. 
And then at the further level, we have what we call systems and structures. And these are things like laws and policies and regulations. We're going to look at another example of that in just a minute. And then, of course, we have cross-cutting themes such as gender, gender norms, social norms, and cultural influences and practices. Now, I have a very strong belief that if you're promoting a behavior, then you have an ethical and moral obligation to put in place a holistic program that makes practicing that behavior possible. Some people wouldn't agree with me, but I believe that very strongly to be true. So let's just look at a few examples of systems and structures issues that have come up in some of my experiences. So I have an example uh, from Niger, West Africa. I was doing a barrier analysis study to determine why IPT, so intermittent preventative treatment for preventative therapy against malaria during pregnancy, the government had instituted a third dose. So they were saying all women, instead of now two doses, they should have three doses. We went out to the field, we started to do a survey, we could not find any non-doers. That is to say, we could not find people who had not received a third dose. So we had to pull back and say, okay, what's going on? Because the data say that people are not getting their third dose, it's very low. Well, what happened was the government instituted a new policy, but they did not create new forms or new recording instruments. So all of the nurses, when giving a third dose to people, would just mark it as a second dose. So the second dose looked like 160% of women had a second dose because they didn't have the correct tools. So we didn't have to convince people to change their behavior. We just needed the government to change their tools. Very simple fix. The next one is an example from Malawi where people didn't want to sleep inside insecticide treated bed nets because they said the white fabric looked too much like burial shrouds. It's what they looked, the fabric that they buried people in and people didn't like that, they didn't accept it. So instead of trying to convince people to use the nets, it was an easier fix in a systems and structure approach to procure blue nets because they're not like the burial shrouds. In Zambia, farmers couldn't afford vegetable seeds sold in bulk, so merchants repackaged them into smaller and more affordable units. So that provided small scale farmers with the amount they need at an affordable price. So it's not that they didn't want to do it and participate, but they couldn't afford the bulk. So changing that, looking at the whole system and structure is more effective than continuing to try to increase people's knowledge. In Cambodia, people in need worked with commercial veterinarians and smallholder farmers who found services were difficult to access. So in this way, farmers who raised poultry could access veterinary services, which were previously only available to large scale pig and cattle farmers. And another note is to plan activities at a time that's convenient for people and when they'll have the resources to participate. So we all know in most countries, there are times that are the lean season when people don't have access to resources. And so that's not a good time to plan your activities. So the next thing we're gonna look at is the health belief model. It's widely used in SBC, and it's one of the tools that we are gonna talk about in the webinar for barrier analysis. You can see that the origins of this model highlighted a person's belief in how susceptible they were. So were they likely to get a disease or have a problem and how severe the problem would be if it happened. And then they weigh in with the benefits and barriers. So how hard is it for me to do and what are the benefits gonna be? And then what's gonna help me remember to do this behavior? So again, this has been expanded upon and adapted. These are the determinants of behavior. You're gonna talk about these in the next webinar when you look at um, the barrier analysis study. And so we look at these determinants of behavior and uh, just very quickly, and then we're gonna talk about some examples of them. But the first one is self-efficacy then positive consequences, negative consequences, and social norms. And these four are in red because most often when we do studies, we find that these come back as most statistically significant. So these are actually categories of reasons why people do or don't do a behavior. Another one might be an access issue, cultural norms, reminders, cues for action means do people remember what to do, when to do, and how to do it. We're doing this a lot right now with COVID-19 wearing masks, how to wear the mask, when to wear the mask, how to wash their hands, when to wash their hands. Another one is what does God or our gods or our religion think about a particular behavior? Another one is action efficacy. 
if I do this behavior, will I get the benefit that's promised to me? So a lot of times people don't believe that the benefit, we're seeing this a lot with COVID-19, people are resistant to wearing masks because of the conflicting information, because the change management wasn't necessarily handled in a great way or a perfect way. And so people don't believe that masks will be useful. And so a lot of people are refusing to wear them. Now we know that we should wear them, that's a different topic, <laughs> but you can see that if I don't believe something's gonna give me the benefit, I might not do it. Another one is, does the policy support it? And then if it happens to me, this goes back to that last slide, how serious would it be? And is it really gonna to happen to me? So I want you to just look at these 12, but focus right here on this little one, perceived self-efficacy. And this is really one of the points we wanna bring home in this webinar, is looking at where knowledge fits into the picture. So you can see if I take this 1 12th, and that's, that pie chart was put that way just so I could break this out. It in no way implies that they are equal influencers, and I want to make that clear. So just because you saw those 12 equal pie charts doesn't mean these all have the same impact or influence, okay? I was just trying to show you. If we pull out this piece of the pie, this is where knowledge fits in. And yet 95% of our resources and our time and our budget and everything we do is focused on increasing knowledge, increasing knowledge, increasing knowledge. So when you look at the overall picture, knowledge is such a small piece of what we need. So let's get just talk about some few examples. I have only a few minutes left and then we're going to go to questions. So if you look at this story that I told you about Fatu, you know, which determinants do you think are represented in this story? Well, certainly there was some self-efficacy. She may have known or not known what we were actually talking to her about, but more than that, there were some very serious social norms at play, right? And her husband was a huge influencer on what she was able to do. So I could have given her knowledge all day long, but she was not empowered. So there was a social norm aspect with her husband. There was also an access issue. She didn't have access to more staple food. She didn't have access to any complementary food. She didn't have access to any condiments. And so you can see that there are different determinants at play in her story. Look at this picture. This one might be difficult to see, I'm sorry, but most of these photos are pre-digital era. So they're old scanned printed photographs. The quality is not stellar, but this is a birthing center. Uh, where I was doing a, a work visit in West Africa and we were doing some studies on and the, the um, program was interested on convincing and I'm putting that in air quotes, convincing women to birth at the maternity instead of birthing at home. I don't know if you can see that, but where I've just circled was blood on the floor. This is a missing stirrup on this very tiny, very skinny, very thin birthing table that has no stool, mind you, to access it, although it's very high. Over here is a dirty bedpan. And so I remember asking the nurse who just went through a rant about why people are not using the birthing services at the clinic. And I looked at this center and I asked him how long ago was it that someone had given birth there? And he told me it had been about a month. And so you're looking at a facility that's filthy, that is ill-equipped, and you want to convince women to give birth there. And so you're wasting your time and your money if you think you're gonna convince women to birth in, under those kind of conditions. So this is an access issue. We don't have access to what we need. And this is not a norm for what is access, uh, acceptable, right? Here's one from Sierra Leone. I love this because most of us, I think probably in every country, when we pay our taxes, we wonder if we're really getting what we want to get out of our uh, tax dollars, right? When you see your tax dollars at work. So this was a poster put out by the president in Sierra Leone. And this relates to action efficacy, doesn't it? It's promising, it says independence means dependence on domestic resources, pay your taxes. So do people believe that they're gonna get what they're paying for when they pay their taxes? These are cues for action. So look at this time of COVID, wear your face mask, do your part, stay six feet apart. Helping people remember not only what to do, but when to do it and how to do it. Safety reminder, lift with your legs. This is a how, not with your back. Here's another one. Uh, reminders, putting reminders in a relevant place. These are reminders in a latrine. 
wash your hands after using the toilet and the facilities are here the water's here let's hope i can't see it the soap is there keep your urinal clean all of the health and safety hygiene messages so not only having the messages there to remind people to do it having the resources there to remind people to do it but also the when and the how remember that people often are motivated by something that's not necessarily the reason that we are promoting it we promote people brushing their teeth with toothpaste because we want them to avoid tooth decay and gum disease, right? We want them to have good oral hygiene. But here's an advertisement that promotes what? Love and intimacy. This is more of a, of a, a perceived positive consequence. I'm going to get nice, fresh breath. I'm going to be able to kiss my partner. I'm going to be attractive to people. Here's some that talk about protect children. Don't make them breathe your smoke. Susceptibility, go to help, get uh, help from a doctor. Smoking can cause a slow and painful death. Again, that goes to severity. So we have susceptibility messages, we have severity messages. <coughs> and these are all on cigarette packages, excuse me. So this one, myth or fact, culture is very strong and cannot be changed. This is, I think I'm wrapping up. I know we're going over on time, I apologize. What do we think about this? Is this a myth or a fact? Culture is very strong and cannot be changed. Many of us avoid issues of culture because we think that we can't change it, but we do it all the time across sectors. Very quick story. We often blame grandmothers for a lot of things that are held in uh, near and dear in culture. And um, I was uh, doing a field visit and I saw a young woman who came in. She was very severely ill postpartum. She was about a week after delivery and the grandmother came in holding the child and the grandmother was feeding the baby goat's milk. And I listened to the nurse berate them both, scream at the grandmother about feeding goat's milk, yell at the woman about not breastfeeding. And so I sat down on the floor and I started to talk to them. And I came to find out that the young woman had come to the clinic the day after her delivery. She had a fever. She didn't feel well. She was in a lot of pain. The nurse had given her pills and I said, what kind of pills did she give you? And the grandmother took them out of the bag and showed them to us. They were still there. She hadn't taken them. And the nurse went nuts on her. And when I calmed them down and I began to ask why she hadn't taken the pills, she said, the nurse never told us how to take them. So she had gone to the clinic, she had sought help, she had gotten medication, but she didn't get the support that she needed. There was no dialogue. There was no support. And what I came to find out was that the grandmother was in tears saying, I know that goat's milk is not good for the baby, but my daughter is so sick, she can't breastfeed and I don't want them both to die. So oftentimes we blame the holders of culture for doing certain things when often they're just trying to solve problems. So we need to understand how culture plays in and how influential culture can be, but more often than not, in my experience, I have found that older generations embrace the change if the change is introduced in an appropriate manner. So with that, we're just going to look at some things you can do moving forward. Some of those are get in touch with an SBC professional who can help you understand what needs to be included in your budget and in your program plans. You can read GIZ's guide, Social and Behavior Change, Insights and Practice, and I'm told that all these links will be available with the video. Ask your staff to participate in this webinar series, so continue the series after this one. Join the core group or listservs where SBC issues are discussed, and then commit publicly to adopt some new practices. Studies show this improves adoption rates, so what can you commit to do from what you learned today? And what are you going to commit going forward for SBC? And then follow up on the resources provided with the webinar for additional reading. So for my side, thank you. Um, here are some resources. These are, these are all going to be, I'm not sure if they're going to be posted in the chat box, but I know they'll be made available to you. And next week, you're going to focus on this one with your webinar, the first one, the Practical Guide to Conducting a Barrier Analysis. So all these uh, are free and available to you. <laughs> And I will turn it over to Cecilia now to moderate some questions in the last few times that we have left. Thank you so much for sharing with us your wisdom and also the principles. I just want to 
go over the principles again. You say they are, uh, people have to have a reason for change. People must be ready for change. People must be involved in the change and people must be surrounded by models of change. And uh, I really like that you emphasize that this is not a one time thing that we have to do in the programs, but it's more of a long term uh, situation. So we have had questions and comments in the chat box. Amir and uh, Rahib asked, can you please explain the difference between SBCC and SBC in between SBCC and IEC? Okay, beautiful question. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you so much. The first thing is that you are going to hear a lot of different terminologies thrown around. Unfortunately, many organizations have their preference for the terminology that they use. Some people use BCC, behavior change communication. Some people use SBC, social and behavior change. And some people use SBCC, social and behavior change communication. But I think in essence, the difference is under when we add the S and we talk about that social aspect, I think what we're trying to do is really focus on that creating that supportive and enabling environment. So that theory of behavior change that takes into account the systems thinking and not just promoting a behavior. The, um, the issue of using SBC tools versus IEC is that generally IEC information, education and communication, those kinds of tools have been around for 30, 40 years. And in my experience, I think it's changing, but in my experience, most of those tools are uniquely focused on increasing knowledge. With you saw that picture of me as a young gal out doing uh, knowledge, awareness, raising sensitization about guinea worm disease. We made flip charts and everything about it was technical, but we didn't understand the dialogue. We didn't understand the communicating and we didn't understand that there was so much more to the process to be able to support behavior change and how we had to create those enabling environments. So I think that's the main difference. When we look at SBC, we're trying to take a more holistic programmatic ap approach, a more holistic communication approach, rather than just telling people what they should do and why it should be important to them. Thank you. Uh, another question that's maybe in the same uh, realm of clarifying approaches is uh, how uh, this was asked by Susan. How is SBC different from behavior economics and nudging approaches? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny because there's quite a bit of buzz out there about using the nudge approach. And I think um, I, I have some colleagues that are, are very uh, appreciative of the nudge approach, sort of, you know, influencing people in a certain direction and other people who think, you know, nudging is really kind of manipulation and that we need to step back and take more dialoguing and communication approach. I think probably a balance between the two is, is actually good. Um, I think, uh, you know, in my fields, we, we used to joke and say that really what we are is we're not, we want to be, you know, we used to say that we were trainers. And then we switched and we said, now we're facilitators because we want to facilitate a process and we want people to come to their own ideas and change. But really a lot of what we do is facilitate. So we, we go in like we're facilitators, but we're really manipulating people to move in the direction that we want them to move. Um, and I think to some degree, when you have program goals and objectives, you, you must do that. Uh, because you, know, you can go into a community and say, well, what are your needs? And you know you can end up hearing them say they want to build roads and they want to build buildings and they want to have internet access and they want to which might have nothing to do with what you're actually promoting or what it is you're trying to achieve with your program objectives so to some degree we have to nudge because we all have a programmatic agenda but i think the idea is you know letting people within a parameter of what it is your mandate is be able to make their own choices and decisions and do a lot of their critical thinking. And I, I'm not sure in the webinar if we're going to talk about human centered design, but but that's a very interesting thing as well. There's a lot of YouTube videos about it. If you're interested, Google human centered design. And there are some beautiful examples of how you can really get a community to embrace the whole process of behavior change that really illustrates those four principles that I presented at the beginning of the webinar. I'm originally from Ecuador. I'm from Latin America and I 
took a course back a few years ago in and I had this similar question that someone posed and uh, I would like you to address this one. Sarah asked, um, is SBC paternalistic? Because we claim to know what is good for others. So um, I love that question. Thank you so much for that. I think to some degree it is because, but remember that last tenet of behavior change or the last tenet of barrier analysis that you'll find in the barrier analysis guide. And that's it. If you don't choose the right behavior to promote, you're not going to make an impact. And really what we should be doing is identifying problems that we have scientific answers to resolve. So the issue then is we, we do know what's good for people in a scientific sense, right? Studies show that. So when we do social behavior change programs, what we hope is that we are promoting things that have been scientifically proven to have a benefit. Okay, so in that respect, it, it, it is because it does need to be guided by research and science and we ethically and morally need to be promoting things that we understand will have a positive outcome for people. So in that respect, it is. But also remember those other tenets of change. People sometimes do things that have positive results, but not for the reason that we promote. And this is one thing I really like to emphasize, that we, we really care that a person does a behavior, but we don't have to spend time convincing them to do it for our reason. Right. Mm. So that's why doing some research and finding out what people value and what their values and goals and priorities are. Sometimes we can take that information and actually link it back to what it is we're promoting. So, uh, for example, I did a study in, in a country in West Africa. We did it around malaria. And one of the things people said when we asked them, what do you want most in your life? Was they said they wanted um, education for their children. And what we found during the study was that one of the positive consequences we found from doers or mothers who put their children inside an insecticide treated bed net at night was mothers said that their children slept very soundly. So what we did was we took that finding, that positive benefit, and we linked it to that desire and talked about, did some messaging and some teaching and some education. And we talked about how if a child gets a good night's sleep, they're more likely to do well in school. They're well rested, they can focus, they can concentrate. And we talked about how much sleep, sound sleep actually helps in education and link that to utilization of the bed nets. And maybe a follow up question on what you're saying um, that was asked by Oluwan Funke. Sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. Um, so to conduct an SBC study, where do we start from? And I will ask the next question too by uh, Tamine, is barrier analysis the first step in planning and implementing SBCC programs? I would go back to that slide that I presented about defining behaviors. And I think that's the first place you really need to start because before you can study it, you need to know what you're looking for. So I think the first place is to, to start with looking at your country indicators, look at your DHS surveys, look at your KAP surveys, look at your agriculture surveys, your nutrition surveys, whatever technical area you're focusing on, look at those surveys, look at the differences between high levels of knowledge and low levels of utilization or implementation. And you're looking at that gap because that gap is what barrier analysis and your research is going to address. So where we do have high levels of knowledge and very low implementation, that's a good place to start. It's not the only place to start, but it's a good place to start. Look at those data and then start by trying to define your behavior. So do we have very well-defined, measurable behavior statements? Do we just say that we want a row plant or do we have very good indicators of what that means? Farmers with less than one hectare of land plant their corn in rows or something like that. So that's probably the best place to start and then come back for the next webinar to know how to continue. C2 Morang is asking, is SBC always supported by material assistance? For example, providing a hand washing facility when we promote hand washing. Uh, and then the next question, is how long does it take to change people's behaviors? So about mm -hmm. you know, the environment of promoting a behavior and also the time that it would okay. take to change a, a behavior. Thank you for those questions, great questions. The first one is no, we don't always have to distribute something. Um, I would venture to say that in my experience in doing this many times, 
and you'll talk about this in the next webinar, when you find that access oftentimes is an issue when you do a study, sometimes, especially in areas where development projects have the history of giving a lot of things and distributing a lot of things, sometimes people will actually report that they don't have access to it because they want to get more. And you have to tease that out. Again, I'll, I'll refer to a malaria study we did. People said they couldn't get insecticide treated bed nets. However, the country had been doing distribution for several years and we knew from studies that 100% of households had at least two bed nets. So we knew that access was not an issue. And so we didn't go back to redistributing nets, but we went back to finding out what are the other reasons why people are not using them. So no, you do not always have to provide access to something. And that's where uh, human-centered design is an amazing tool because it helps communities find their own resources, their own solutions, and, and really put it back on themselves and take it really out of the hands of the, the programmers. The programmers facilitate that process so that people can become their own problem solvers. And I think this goes back to my point about people becoming critical thinkers. If you look at that slide that I did about the barrier road, when I said, look, I've got this water I've got to get through, if I'm a programmer and I sit in my office and I say, well, I'm going to give everybody bathing suits to get through this water, that's not going to be an acceptable solution to everybody. It is going to be to some people, but to other people, it's not going to be an acceptable solution. So without that dialogue, we can't understand what people really need. And this is where your structures that you have in your programs are a really good way because you have to have that dialogue. So in health a lot, we use care group, the care group model. Um, in, in uh, there's a lot of farmer groups, uh, extension agents, agriculture agents. So whatever program you're working in, you might have these extension agents of some sort or community workers. And that's where teaching them critical thinking skills really comes into play because it, it takes the problem and it puts it back on the person and says, what can you do to solve your problem? So let's see what people can do first and what they're willing to do and what's acceptable to them. And then we see what we need to put in place as a supportive mechanism. And it might just be a supportive issue. It might not be a commodity. It could just be something to support. It could actually even be a policy. Or it could be like the one I shared an example of for malaria prevention treatment. It could be changing a form. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a distribution of something. The mm -hmm. other issue about time um, is that in some settings, that's, this is another myth that behavior change takes a long time. Some behavior change happens very quickly. You see that a lot in emergency settings, like in Ebola. Hand washing uptake during Ebola in many places was very, very, very quick. Why? Because they could see the severity of the issue and the susceptibility impressions were high. Their perceptions of susceptibility were very high because the disease was very visible to them. Um, but also because it was an easy thing to do and the resources were made available and it was everywhere because, uh, and, we're, and we're kind of in the same situation now with the coronavirus pandemic in that, uh, you know, a lot of people have changed their behaviors very quickly in wearing masks, washing hands, using hand sanitizer, and other people have not. So I think that that's a very individual yeah. process and you're gonna see groups and cohorts, but this is also where the social norm comes into play and can be very, very powerful. And this is a question related to then how easy or how difficult change could be. And Utibe asks, how do you convince a farmer to adopt new techniques after using particular practices for more than 60 years of her life and has been seeing tangible results? Well, first principle of behavior change. You have to think about the what's in it for her. Um, so if she doesn't think it's broken, she is not gonna to strive to fix it. And so the only way to really convince someone who is reticent to change a behavior is to show them an increased benefit. There was that slide in the presentation from Afghanistan where you saw the farmer with a big bunch of radishes and another farmer beside him with a smaller bunch, right? So you have to convince her that she can get an added benefit from doing it in a different way. And to be quite frank, we don't like to think about it as programmers, but if people are doing things that are working, should we ethically be trying to change their behavior? And I don't know what that particular situation is. I don't know if there's something that's healthier about it, that the yield will be better, that it takes less resources. So there might be 
other kinds of reasons that you might want to convince someone to change a behavior. I know in the US, a lot of times we try to change behaviors um, just more because it's easier on the environment or you try to people to appeal to a value system that someone has that's in line with that behavior that you're trying to promote. So I think if you have resistance, part of that might be the value system that's there and you need to do more dialoguing and find out what it is about the way she's currently doing it versus the way you're promoting and where do her values fit into that. It also might be the way it's presented, right? You're doing something wrong, you should do it this way. Even if people were open to change and we tell them that they're wrong, what happens? They close up. Think about when family planning is, was introduced into many developing countries. The message that came from the Western world was, you have too many children, right? So why wasn't family planning adopted right away? Because people were offended by that message. This is, these are cultures and value systems where children are wealth. Children are a blessing from God. Children are what you strive to have in your life. So if someone comes in and says, you have too many, what does that say to you? Because it's not in line with your value system. But if you can say, what do you value? Well, I value education and health for my children. Then you can deliver family planning in a way that is in accordance with their value system and say, well, did you know that if you use modern family planning and you space your children, you will actually be able to make sure your children are healthy, they'll be well nourished, you can afford to educate them. So you can put those benefits back into their own value system. I will end with this question uh, from Suman before we move into the, the verbal input. Suman asks, uh, how can we initiate SBC virtually? Um, I guess in the time of COVID-19, there is a lot of you know, barriers to being able to do these activities. So how can we initiate this process virtually? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think we're all really learning how to do that. Um, when COVID-19 hit, I was working in a refugee camp outside of my own country and I was, uh, you know, stranded. And, um, but what I discovered was that almost everybody in that camp had a phone with capacities for at least WhatsApp. And the Ministry of Health that was operating in that camp was actually pretty tech savvy. And they started making little education videos, just little, you know, 20, 30 second, one minute maximum videos that they began distributing to all the residents of the camp and that talked about things like transmission, hand washing, and they were on the ball very quickly sending those things out. So I think, you know, the first thing you have to do is assess what's available to people um, I, I do know of a lot of projects that are available now and organizations where text messaging for health messages or agriculture message or any development that you can have partnerships with the telecom companies or there are apps that you can use that don't actually take any data to send these sorts of messages. But I think in this time, just communication is key. Telephone calls. If you have structures set up where you have extension agents or you have community health workers or care group volunteers, those sorts of calls and interactions with people in our, in our groups, uh, members of our groups, beneficiary groups, or priority group members, that uh, the simple and simple is, is better because of things like bandwidth issues and all of those sorts of things. So I think just keeping in communication is is probably the best thing we could do. Personally, I think WhatsApp is amazing. I have many, many, many groups that I participate in for WhatsApp for a myriad of different technical issues and SBC issues, and I find them very helpful. Thank you. So we have some people who have raised their hand, uh, and so I will now unmute you according to what I see here. Thank you very much, Danielle, for that wonderful presentation. My name is Rose from the University of Nairobi. My question is on uh, about the health belief uh, model. Uh, what do you think about using the health belief model in trying to influence change of a certain behavior? Because I know some people they think that it may not be effective in changing behavior, even when the barriers can be identified and addressed. And uh, I think you've also talked about it uh, when you're talking about the Ebola case in West Africa. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Rose. Welcome from Nairobi. Appreciate that. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, in um, the tools that, that many of us use right now, uh, specifically the barrier analysis is pretty much based on that health belief model. We use the health belief model, we use the socio-ecological model, we use the stages of change model. Um, I think that it's a good basis. It's kind of the premise for that whole barrier road situation because all of us know there are certain things that, or, you know, we can call them barriers to me personally in my personal life. I call them excuses because, you know, they are, but they, they are very real barriers. And, uh, and so I, I believe that, you know, that model was started, I, I believe, with scientists trying to help people stop smoking. And so it was very smoking centered, which is why I think the first two determinants that they used was susceptibility and severity. And then it has been expanded through the years. So that model or the, the behavior change framework, which I believe you'll talk about in subsequent webinars, was really based on some tools that have been used since the late 90s, early 2000s. And as they've been used and studies have been done, they've validated more and more these determinants actually in amongst other sectors as well. So we used to call the, the health belief model and this, the 12 determinants of health behavior. But now people have been using them in other sectors, in WASH, in agriculture and natural resource management, and they're finding them to hold true. They're finding them to be valid. So I believe that it is a good basis. I believe that it's a good basis for research because that is what the barrier analysis is based on. And if you join us for the next webinar, you'll learn much more about that. And then that barrier analysis feeds into the designing for behavior change framework tool, which I personally use in every program that I do. And especially when I'm writing high level strategies, when I do research for high level strategies, I always do barrier analysis. I always do designing for behavior change as a basis for my communication strategy for social behavior change. So personally, I think that they are great tools. Um, I haven't found anything else that I would completely replace them with at this point. I think there are other tools that can complement, but I do still see that that health belief model for the work that I'm doing anyway is really the basis of, of what I use in, in my personal work and programming. Thank you. And for the sake of time, uh, I will wrap up the, the webinar right now. And uh, next time, I hope uh, to leave more time for perhaps the verbal questions so we can have uh, here other participants too. Um, but thank you so much everyone for, for joining. We have a webinar evaluation uh, that will be shared with you. And also uh, if you can share it in the, in the chat box, that would be good to the link, but please help us fill, filling out the evaluation. You can also download the resources um, for this webinar at the ANH Academy website. And there you will also find a recording um, with French subtitles in a little bit. Uh, there will be both a YouTube recording and also the, the link at the ANH Academy. Our next webinar will be next month on Tuesday, August 11th at 2 p.m. Uh, BST time. And it will be about how to understand the barriers and motivators to behavior change. And we do, someone was asking earlier, uh, we will provide a certificate to people who attend at least four webinars. So please uh, make sure you register with your same email and same name so that we can keep track of your attendance. Thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you, Danielle and everyone who organized uh, we really appreciate 